are, as I said, very glad to have Boeing as our primary sponsor for the day. And our host is John Elbon, who's the Vice President and Program Manager of Commercial Crew Programs at Boeing. Um, it, it, it's all the commercial crew, the uh, cargo processing, uh, CCDV, CCDEV. John has had a, a apparently a sense of background. He had the Army programs at Boeing, had Constellation, International Space Station, and before that he had real work down at Kennedy with the, the uh, checkout assembly and payload processing, and uh, that's, that's a tough job. <laughs> but you get to work at Kennedy, and that's all good. Uh, without further ado, John Elbon. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody, for being here this afternoon. Uh, Boeing is certainly uh, pleased and honored to be able to sponsor today's luncheon. So this morning in the opening plenary, we heard uh, thoughts on challenges facing a sustainable space policy. General Palakowski talked about the importance of her programs, the resiliency they must possess, and the challenges of accomplishing what needed to be accomplished with the limited budget. Mark Valero talked about engaging people so they understood the importance of what we were doing and generating excitement. Charles Alachi talked about the key role that space uh, plays in driving innovation and driving the economy in turn. And Roger Crone talked about keeping a new workforce motivated when our programs have a, uh, a time constant of decades as opposed to months and years that the new generation workforce is used to. So all those challenges have formed a backdrop as NASA has worked to shape our civil space policy over the past two or three years. It's been a somewhat contentious debate, but it's now settled on a general path forward, a balance between science, human spaceflight, and technology development. Within human spaceflight, a plan has been laid out to utilize ISS through at least 2020 to leverage commercial providers of cargo and crew transportation to provide affordable services, transportation services, and to do that in a way then that leaves margin in NASA's budget to focus on developing capabilities for exploration beyond LEO, beyond low Earth orbit, and that is SLS and Orion. As an implementer of that policy, I can't emphasize enough the importance of indus to industry of, this, of some stability going forward. If our space programs are to survive, we must maintain momentum and make progress on a very definite path. I'm honored today to introduce Lori Garver, who is involved in all those programs and is going to share with us her thoughts on a sustainable space policy. As Deputy Administrator of NASA, Lori works closely with Charlie Bolden, the NASA Administrator, to provide overall leadership, planning, and policy direction for the agency. Lori has dedicated her career to the development of space and the exploration of the great unknowns. She studied political science and economics in school and then turned to space when she accepted a job working for Senator John Glenn in the early 1980s, and she's never looked back. She earned a master's degree in science, technology, and public policy from George Washington University and went on to a variety of senior roles in nonprofit and commercial sectors, as well as NASA. For a time, she also trained to realize her own personal dream of space travel. Lori was the lead civil space policy advisor for the 2008 Obama presidential campaign and led the agency review team for NASA during the post-election transition. Today, she's dedicated some of her time to talk with us, and I look forward to what she has to say. Hope you do, too. Thanks, Lori. The podium is yours. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it sounds like you got the memo. Uh, it is indeed a privilege to be here uh, on behalf of of NASA, and thank you to AIAA uh, for your leadership. Uh, this is truly um, 
something that we work with together as an industry and government and academia, and uh, we look forward to strengthening our uh, partnerships and our commercial space industry assume, as our commercial space industry assumes even more of a role in this new era of human and scientific space exploration. So I cannot begin this day without taking a moment to acknowledge that it's the 11th anniversary of 9-11. I think that the highest honor that we can pay those who lost their lives and those who rushed to the, to the flames and rubble that day to save lives is to build on the sacrifice by carrying on the work of building our more perfect union. That is why all of you do every day your work to keep America in the forefront of technological innovation. In your efforts to expand the boundaries of human knowledge and exploration, in your commitment to improve life on Earth, and in your determination to leave the planet better than you found it. That has been the mission of AIAA and indeed NASA for more than 49 years. And as the world's largest professional society devoted to the progress of engineering and science in aviation, space, and defense, you've not only served the goals of NASA and our nation, but you've benefited humankind. I want to give a personal thanks and appreciation to your leadership, Bob Dickman uh, and Mike Griffin, and Bob, you in particular as you're leaving, uh, thank you for your leadership. So on this day, So on this day of remembrance, let us honor the fallen by rededicating ourselves to making every day a day of service. I also want to take a moment to honor the memory of the two pioneers of our industry who recently passed away and as were highlighted in the program. On July 23rd, we lost astronaut Sally Ride, America's first woman to fly to space. And on August 25th, Neil Armstrong, the first human to set foot on the surface of the moon, passed away. Neil and Sally were best known for their pioneering achievements in space, but their service to our nation did not stop there. In fact, even before joining NASA in the 1950s, Neil had served in both World War II and the Korean War as a Navy fighter pilot. He flew 78 combat missions in the Korean War, and after making history as the commander of the Apollo 1969 uh, 11 moon landing, he remained one of the nation's greatest champions for space exploration, having worked with him personally on the anniversaries the 20th, the 25th, the 30th, and the 40th. Uh, it was apparent to all that he did not make those occasions for personal purposes, but for the benefit of NASA. Uh, he also took on leadership positions in corporate America and in academia, where he devoted himself to inspiring new generations of scientists and explorers. Sally Ride became the first American woman and the youngest American to make spaceflight when she flew as a member of the STS-7 crew in 1983. Like Neil, she too was a trailblazer. After leaving the astronaut corps, she became a professor of physics at the University of California, San Diego, and in 2001, she founded Sally Ride Science, which allowed her to pursue her lifelong passion of motivating girls and young women to pursue careers in science and technology. Uh, while being public symbols of heroism uh, was not what either of these two set out to achieve, their graceful handling of these roles uh, was appreciated by us all. And like so many of you, it is a privilege and has been a privilege of my career uh, to have personally worked with them. Sally Ride and Neil Armstrong remind us, especially on this day, that we can develop all the technology in the world, but in the final analysis, all of this is about people. It's about making life better here on Earth, about improving the human condition, expanding our knowledge, expanding our partnerships across, across the Earth in pursuit of a larger goal that none of us could achieve on our own. That's what I want to talk to you about this afternoon. The theme of the conference fits perfectly with the NASA mission and uh, that we have pursued over these past four years, creating a sustainable vision for space. 
That is what we and President Obama have focused on since we arrived in Washington in 2009. But there is an old adage, you can't know where you are going until you know where you've been. So I want to outline just briefly uh, a review of where we stood four years ago. We inherited the decision of the previous administration to end NASA's 30-year space shuttle program, a decision that was supported by several Congresses. And we faced the consequences, reached the conclusions reached by an independent president presidentially appointed commission, the Augustine Commission, that America's human spaceflight program was indeed on an unsustainable trajectory. Because the shuttle's follow-on program constellation was uh, critically over budget and behind schedule, the path that we were on would have left us without space transportation uh, for five to seven years, a gap in human space capability with no space station. Without that space station, we had no human presence, we had a lack of international cooperation for the future, and we did not have the necessary research on human uh, exploration to go further. So the framework of our new approach is contained in the Bipartisan NASA Authorization Act of 2010, which supported the President's plan to expend, extend the life of the space station, foster the development of path-breaking technologies, help create thousands of new jobs, embark on a fundamentally more ambitious strategy to expand our frontiers in space and launch a strong government space transportation, commercial space transportation industry. Well, what a difference four years makes. The Obama administration has proposed a record four-year investment of more than $74 billion for NASA. And while uh, Congress is not fully uh, committed to that entire request, we have a very strong bipartisan commitment on the path that we were on, as John Alon talked about. Specifically, on Florida's space coast alone, the President has fought to invest uh, over $1.4 billion in NASA's 21st Century Space Launch Complex and Exploration Ground Systems. This investment is helping us upgrade Kennedy Space Center's shuttle area era facilities to support multiple users and make this a more flexible launch facility for the future. And since 2010, we've made significant investments in our commercial crew space program, the goal of which is to bring human spaceflight launches back to American soil and end the outsourcing of these important jobs. We are on track to, by 2017, rely again on America, American companies for safe, reliable, and cost-effective crew transportation and rescue services for low Earth orbit activities. This will allow NASA to continue to lead the world in aeronautics, in Earth and space science, and to advance technologically, and to concentrate on building America's next generation of space exploration systems, the Orion spacecraft, and the Space Launch System, the vehicle and rocket that will take American astronauts farther into space than any spacecraft developed for human spaceflight uh, for the last 40 years since our astronauts visited the moon. Our deep space destinations include sending humans to an asteroid in 2025 and to Mars by the 2030s, and we are recruiting and training new astronauts for these missions. Our dual-track exploration strategy is already working. In May, as you may have heard, SpaceX became the first private company to launch to the International Space Station, berth to the station, and recover the Dragon capsule after a water landing with cargo intact. Later this year, Orbital Sciences Corporation, another commercial entity, is planning to conduct its own demonstration missions uh, of a similar cargo resupply capability. Creating a sustainable vision for space is, in fact, exactly what our plan is allowing us to do. We've experienced many times the cost and inefficiencies of relying solely on tax dollars for space activities. Indeed, for most space activities, this is no longer the case. Those most robust, technically advanced and efficient systems count on government funding for only a portion of their uh, uh, capabilities, so for only a portion of their markets. So uh, if you include remote sensing, communications, uh, 
tracking uh, satellite manufacturing. It is only through shared markets uh, and costs with the private sector that we are truly able to create a sustainable vision for space. So this is, in fact, how other industries advance, as was true for most of our industry as well. The example of space communications really struck me the other day when Secretary Donnelly reminded us that the Air Force buys 70 percent of its cap communications capability from the private sector. Buying that service uh, commercially allows the Air Force to spend less of its precious resources owning and operating these systems and help secure a more cost-effective and stable capability. And while contributing to the growth of uh, economic and national security. So some have said it's not the job of the government to help advance new commercial industries like space transportation, especially for human space transportation. But why should the way we develop this capability uh, be any different than those that we have been developing? Where would our economy and our national leadership be if the government had not invested in biotech, in ARPANET, uh, where would we be without NASA's early investments in advanced communications? Indeed, without the government's investment in early space transportation. We invest in technologies, we partner with industry by developing capabilities of specific applicability to our government, and then we serve as an anchor tenant to buy down both the technical and the market risks. Success of this plan will allow for this more sustainable uh, vision for space because it will mean that more of the basic operational needs of our programs will not be beholden entirely to this government system of assigning how tax dollars are spent with the obvious and necessary changes of elected uh, leadership and the annual appropri appropriations processes that our democracy demand. And while NASA uh, will then be able to focus on what we do best, exploring even deeper into the universe. So to that end, on July 2nd, which also marked the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy Space Center, I was at KSC along with Senator Bill Nelson and Center Director Bob Cabana and officials from Lockheed Martin for the unveiling of the agency's first space-bound Orion spacecraft to Kennedy Space Center. Orion is undergoing final construction and integration at KSC in preparation for its first flight in 2014. In 2017, NASA Space Launch System, a heavy launch rocket that will provide an entirely new capability for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and will launch Orion on a mission to the moon. During the next four years, we have created a new space technology program to spur innovation and to build a future with more capability than we have today. Calls for increased investment in technology at NASA have been consistent uh, for more than a decade. And we're very proud that we now have over a half a billion dollar investment, again, in technology. Again, we're, uh, of course, would love to see more, and we're working uh, with our partners on the Hill to make that happen. NASA has also continued to perform amazing feats in science and launched missions that will provide data that will guide us for decades to come. The whole world literally held its breath on the night of August 5th, or the morning of August 6th, depending on where you were at this planet, uh, as NASA returned to Mars. After an astounding 352 million mile journey and a harrowing landing that demonstrated cutting edge technology, Curiosity, the largest rover ever sent to another planet, is now in place and doing her job, thanks to the leadership Charles Alacci and Jean Tatini at JPL. Uh, the robotic laboratory is now uh, working as one of, uh, to answer one of humanity's oldest questions that in, as it investigates whether conditions have favored development of microbial life on the red planet. The mission is a critical planetary science mission and a precursor to sending humans to the red planet in the 2030s, a goal stated by President Obama. Numerous other science missions are also currently expanding our knowledge of the solar system and improving uh, our life here on Earth.
At this very moment, a stream of data is flowing in from missions orbiting the Sun, Mercury, the Moon, the asteroid Vesta, Mars, and Saturn. We now have missions on their way to Jupiter and Pluto. 16 Earth science missions currently are in orbit that study the Earth as an integrated system. Two weeks ago, we launched NASA's Radiation Belt Storm Probes, the first twin spacecraft mission designed to explore that pl the planet's radiation belts. The Hubble, the Spitzer, Chandra, and Fermi Space Telescopes continue to make groundbreaking discoveries on a daily basis. And we're on track for the construction of the James Webb Space Telescope, the most sophisticated science telescope ever constructed. Last year, the MESSENGER spacecraft entered orbit around Mercury. The ebb and flow satellites began mapping the gravity fields of the moon, and Juno launched on its way to Jupiter. Also, in 2011, Aquarius produced the first global view of ocean surface salinity and the Suomi National Polar Orbiting Partnership Satellite, NPP, began making observations of Earth's weather and climate. I want to conclude by clarifying a couple of misconceptions about NASA's direction. Some have claimed that we are adrift and with no clear spaceflight destinations and no plans for the future. But nothing could be farther from the truth. The perpetuation of this myth only hurts our entire industry and undermines our nation's goals at this critical time, period. The truth is we have an ambitious series of deep space destinations that we have been exploring and that we are on track as we continue to explore with both robots and astronauts. And we are hard at work developing the hardware and the technologies to continue this exploration. So here are just a couple of different ways of uh, graphically depicting our sustainable path. In fact, we just recently delivered a comprehensive report to Congress outlining our destinations, which make clear that the SLS will go well beyond low Earth orbit to explore the expanse of space around the Earth-Moon system, near-Earth asteroids, and ultimately to Mars. Let's say that again. We're going back to the moon. We're attempting the first other mission to spend humans to an asteroid and actively developing a plan to take Americans to Mars. Now, this morning, Roger Crone talked about uh, the comparison of early exploration and the development of ships and the generations it took to explore our own planet and how long those periods of exploration took although they were ultimately, of course, sustainable. And it made me think about our own exploration efforts and how, uh, by comparison, we are traveling, indeed, at light speed. So ours is a big, uh, bold plan, and we uh, understand the risks, but we believe it is achievable. It's all outlined in this new NASA report that we're giving out uh, at the back of the lunch, if, if uh, on your way out you want to get it, which is called Voyages, which aligns with the report we delivered to Congress uh, last week on our plans and our destinations, some of which uh, these charts are being shown. So considering that we announced the selection of SLS uh, their design just a year ago this week on September 14th of 2011, we've certainly made a lot of progress in that year and that has only been achievable because of the hard work of so many of you. Finally, we sometimes hear that NASA has lost its edge and that we're no longer the world leader in space. In fact, some have suggested that we're struggling to be number three This opinion is, in my view, woefully uninformed, or worse, a bet against America. And that, in fact, is never a good bet. When I travel overseas and work with our international partners, the admiration and respect that they feel for NASA and our plan is universal. Uh, this respect has been built, of course, over 50 years of hard work on behalf of all of us. 
uh, but it is not, not at all diminished, but in fact enhanced by our current plan. Uh, when you talk to our uh, partners overseas, they too want to innovate. They too want to trust their industry more and develop new competitive vehicles. And uh, they are extremely envious of our resources and our political leadership and will we have in the United States. In fact, if you total every space agency budget around the world, they total just 75% of NASA's budget. So for those who think our space program is in decline, I have this simple message. President Obama and NASA have created a sustainable vision for space. America continues to lead the world in space exploration. We're successfully undertaking missions that other nations can only dream about, unleashing the entrepreneurial spirit of American industry to do what it does best, and investing in game-changing technologies that will revolutionize space travel and life on Earth. The best days of the space program are indeed ahead of us. And have no doubt, America's space program is better off than it was four years ago, and so is our aerospace industry. According to the latest uh, annual report from the American in uh, Industries Association, AIA, in 2001 marked the eighth straight year of sales growth with annual sales projected to top $218 billion. And even with the transitions occurring in the space industry, our sector sales increased to a projected $46.4 billion in 2011. And with more than 624,000 people employed, our industry continues to be an engine of job creation. All of this is true because of you, and I want to thank, again, AIAA and the support you have given NASA and America's aerospace industry throughout the years. And I want to thank all of our supporters in government, industry, and academia for supporting our vision and to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. As NASA prepares to journey to places in space that no human has ever gone before, we stand on the shoulders of pioneers like Neil Armstrong and Sally Ride. And while they, and many of you, have laid the foundation for an even brighter future. As Neil Armstrong's family said in their statement on Neil's passing, he would want us to be willing to explore and push the limits of our abilities. And that is our mission, and this is our moment. Thank you for getting us here. Uh, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. The, uh, the two sure things about any questions you ask is if you do it from your chair, everyone else won't hear the question and neither will, neither will Administrator Gari. So if you would go to the microphones and the floor is open for questions for Laurie. Or not. In the in the President's uh, plan a couple of years ago, there was a quintupling of funding for asteroid uh, search. What happened to it? I have not, not been able to find that anywhere. President's budgets are proposals. And uh, it, of course, we work with a whole political system to uh, have an actual budget passed by Congress. And, uh, some of those proposals that were not passed, we, we continue to pursue in smaller ways. I, I actually believe that the path we are on was this, uh, a compromise that we do recognize is going to be able to use some of the, I think, investments of the private sector to do things like uh, find asteroids. There have been at least two entities, B612 and Planetary Resources lately, that have come out with plans to do just that. And NASA has a Space Act agreement already with the B612 Foundation, thanks to the work of Bill Gersemeyer and his folks, and we look to uh, being able to do that, uh, in fact, together. So it's probably a, a positive development.
between this crowd and dessert. There's, ah, there we go. Come. Good. Uh, does NASA have a plan for sequester? And if so, when will we know what it is? Uh, questions on sequester. We in uh, the administration, of course, continue to hope and believe that Congress will do its job and pass a budget uh, before we get to that point. Uh, as we have to begin uh, planning for uh, what would happen, we know that uh, about a $1.4 billion reduction in NASA's budget is what would come out of sequester. And I'll say that an organization like NASA, it doesn't take much to recognize that our uh, very high institutional overhead costs uh, mean that those things that would be cut with that large of a cut would be uh, the meat, the programs, the very uh, advancements that I, I talked about in the speech. So uh, while we hope for the best, we certainly are planning uh, in case uh, the worst happens and it will come at a great cost to the space program. Anything else? Oh, okay. Um, Lori, in, in the, on the Hill last year there was some movement or pressure to down select to a single provider for, for a commercial crew. Um, I'm personally glad that seemed to die at the moment, but how do you project that coming out in the future? What, what's, what are your plans? You know, these things are certainly a balance between uh, trying to keep the benefits of competition, but also recognizing that your resources, if they are divided uh, too much, uh, would add to the schedule. So uh, we actually believe we got to a place that is probably ideal, uh, being able to have the three competitors that we have now, uh, we are committed to continuing competition as long as possible. Uh, we believe that the benefits you get uh, from that outweigh uh, the added costs. In fact, there have been a number of analysis done that says if you go to a sole provider, in fact, your costs would be more than if you have competition because you wouldn't have those great uh, drivers and incentives that our uh, capitalist society has through competition. So uh, these things are budget driven, but we are committed to keeping competition through uh, as long as we can through our acquisition plan. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, Administrator Garber. Thank we you. We appreciate it. Thank very you. comprehensive talk. This concludes our luncheon program. The coffee and dessert will be served in the exhibit hall, and then the, uh, the program will resume at 2.30.